Welcome back to the 30th edition of the Tiger Highland Online. I'm Bennett Ford. And I'm Joey Dobson. Here's a look at some semester projects and news stories from last semester. Here's a story by Luke and Terrell about small group study halls for failing students who need additional help. Study halls in the high school have been changing into smaller study halls. Our uh, small study hall, uh, small group study hall initiative is a response to uh, some of our professional learning community work where we um, ask uh, four big questions. What do we want our students to know? How do we know if they know it? Uh, what do we do? Number three, this is the big one. What do we do if they don't know that information? And number four, if they do, what, what other opportunities can we provide for our students? Enrichment opportunities. So what do we do if the students don't know what we want them to know? Uh, we need to be uh, uh, sensitive to students that, that work at, a, at a, a different pace, that may not be getting some of the information. And so the small study hall, uh, small group study hall is an opportunity for those students to uh, have a teacher that intervenes and helps those students get that work completed. And uh, so that's the big thing. Sometime during the school day where we can work with, with students that are, that are at risk of uh, underachieving or even failing a class. And what, what we see is uh, data on a, on a monthly basis where uh, we see over 100 students that are that are failing, that are that are getting D's or F's, and we don't think that's acceptable. So we're trying to target those those students in a pilot uh, right now, just with a couple departments: our English and Social Studies department. Uh, each teacher has referred uh, several students, and if they have time during their school day, or they have a, a large study hall right now, that they they could benefit from a smaller group uh, where a teacher takes personal interest with them. And, and the referring teacher provides the information uh, that they need to work on, we think that could be a real positive for, for some of our students. This is Terrell Christie and Luke Krieger reporting for the Tiger Highline Online. Here's a story about the Art Club's Gingerbread House Project by Alyssa, Richie, and Ahmed. There are many activities at Cedar Falls High School and one of them include the Art Club. Recently, the Art Club had a gingerbread house making competition where they split up into groups and competed in making the best gingerbread house. Senior Janie Graveman shares a little bit about the event. We are having a contest. It's a Christmas party. We're just kind of building uh, gingerbread houses. And we're going to have a contest. It's pretty much just for fun. It's all of us in that building on one If you're interested in joining the art club, meetings are held after school in the art room. Just like come in and just just enjoy yourself. Like there's no pressure. It's just to have fun. This is Richie. Ahmed. And Alyssa. Reporting for the Cedar Falls Tiger Highline Online. Our next story is about the CFHS dance team wrapping up an award-winning season by Clint. The Cedar Falls dance team had a far from average experience at the state dance competition this year. Senior Allie Armstrong shares her experience. Um, we got Division I in Hip Hop and Co-Ed and then we got first place in Palm and our all-male guys got first place in the Judges' Choice Award, and we all won Sportsmanship Award. And getting first place in Palm was especially important because we could have never dreamed of this. We hoped to maybe get fifth place, and then we ended up getting first, and it was just an unbelievable surprise to us. Coaches Alyssa Nolte and Shannon Crucial talk about what it's like to be on the competition dance team in their time at the state competition. Well, the dance team works really hard. We start um, at the beginning of April when we start all of our practices. We practice all summer, and I counted up one time we practice over 500 hours a year for this competition team. Um, we're very, very excited about the success of the dance team, very, very surprised. It was a great, great state experience. One thing that's great about this dance team is that they get up really early in the morning. We have 6 a.m. practice every Tuesday and Thursday. They practice every day um, once we get closer to state, and they work really hard. They really, really believe in what they're doing. They really have a passion for it. So it's really fun to watch them grow 
watch them change and watch them become better dancers. And being a part of dance team too, it's not just in practice, like most of them take class outside of practice, so they're dancing all day. Like I teach a good chunk of them at night and you never would know that they've been up since 5 a.m. dancing, going to school all day. Like they are definitely athletes in that they train 24 hours a day. I mean, they're constantly doing things to prepare for the state competition, so. Um, so I came in in August and taught them their prom routine over a weekend and then they worked on it without me for a little bit and I would come in every once in a while and make adjustments and I have to say that they made amazing progress this year. I think I was out of practice like three weeks before they left and I, wasn't very happy with how it looked, so they, they've worked really hard and they really pulled together when it mattered to have a really great performance. Well, there are 14 classes of POM, which means they take all the schools that participate in POM and divide them up into different sized groups. Um, we are in class 13 POM, which means we are one of the largest divisions there is. Um, every single person in our division received a division one, which means they all scored at least 60 points, which is a big deal. We were the only division that day to, to, to do such a thing. Winning first, we were shocked, yeah. honestly <laughs> shocked. You know, when they announced fourth and fifth, we were like, oh, you know, that's too bad. When they announced third and second, we were like, oh, you know, that really sucks. Those, you know, we feel bad for the girls. And when they announced that we had won first place, <laughs> I, I cried. <laughs> I was so excited. I yeah, actually cheered. Really yeah. um, the girls were so excited. It's a really big deal. It hasn't been done by a Cedar Falls Palm team since the 70s, so it's really exciting for us. It was really exciting, and our whole section was shocked. And as an alumni of the team, like for me and the other alumni that were there, it was really, really exciting because when we were on the team, like that was something we always dreamed of, but we didn't get close. So a lot of what the girls accomplished, they did through hard work, um, not just their talent. So we're really proud of them. The all-male dance team also won first place their third year in a row. Senior Evan Fairbanks talks about his time on the dance team. I've been on dance for three years. It's a great experience. It's awesome having that brotherhood connection. It was awesome seeing the girls win this year. They really deserved it. And the whole experience was just awesome. I love being a part of it. This has been Clint Fletcher reporting for Tiger News. CPR certification is now required from all students at Cedar Falls High School. Here's a story by Kaz, Malcolm, and Andrea. This year, the federal government has put a law in place that requires high school seniors to be CPR certified before they can graduate. The senior class had a lot to say about this new law. I'm in the CPR thing right now, and while I think it's a good thing to know how to save people's lives, I don't think it should be required to be able to graduate. I think it should be the uh, option of the kids if they want to do it or not. Hello, um, I think that the CPR is helpful because you never know what kind of situation you could be put in. I think it's good that we have to take a class over, but I don't think it should be a requirement for graduation. Because I don't think our like graduation depends on CPR. We interviewed Mr. Becker about the CPR training. Well, the Healthy Kids Act had many requirements that it put on school districts that we had to make some adjustments for. You know, school lunches would be one of them, but uh, also there was CPR. Um, schools are required to expose all graduating seniors with CPR. They don't necessarily have to have their certification, but they need to have had been exposed to it. So we're doing this in our physical education classes. <music> graduates needs to have gone through it so our conflict next year won't, won't we won't have because every single sophomore will have had it in physical education our current seniors have a problem because when they were sophomores and they were in physical education we were not doing the CPR certification at that time. So we need to catch up our seniors. And what we're doing is uh, we're offering seniors to come in during a physical education class, during the release, during the early bird, uh, during the study hall, and, and get it done. In the end, I think it's a good idea. Um, it doesn't hurt for all of us to have that information. If, uh, if someone ends up saving a life, it'll be all worthwhile. 
Our next story is by Bennett Ford, who profiles Jake Buck's drive to be a quality running back. Growing up um, in Cedar Falls, Cedar Falls is such a football town. Friday nights you can find half the city in the dome. And uh, yeah, as an elementary student, that's what, that's what we did. We'd go to the games. Wouldn't really watch it, but you'd run around and you'd, you'd think about when your time came when you were in high school and playing football. And I know for some of the guys, you know, that was big time, and that's uh, that's what you want to do. And that was definitely me um, looking out there and seeing the greats, like uh, growing up watching Taylor Brookins, um, watching Terrence Freeney, um, Barkley. I mean, that the program just produces great running backs, and there's a name to live up to. And I didn't want to be the one that skips the beat, so I worked my butt off and made sure that I was, you know, I didn't, that we didn't uh, miss that. I mean, I bet if you would have asked everybody in that locker room who the running back was going to be next year, that all of them would have said um, Nick Clark, except for me. And I was definitely one person to believe in myself, and um, I, I just didn't give up on that. And I was, uh, you just got to hold that to yourself, as believing in yourself is a really big thing. When the 2012 Cedar Falls Tiger football season rolled around, the position of running back had a big question mark on it. Cedar Falls was coming off a semifinal visit to the Iowa High School State Playoffs. Much of it was due to the play of Barkley Hill and various other seniors. Hill started at running back for three years and ran for a total of 6,097 yards and 89 touchdowns. Hill's yard total was only 456 yards off Terrence Freeney's record of 6,553. With the exit of Hill to the University of Iowa, the position had big shoes to fill. In walked Jake Buck. Buck, a senior, had excelled along with Nick Clark during their sophomore year sharing the ball. However, during their junior season on varsity, both lived behind the shadow of Hill. Standing at just 5'7 and 160 pounds, Buck stands 5 inches shorter and 50 pounds smaller than Hill. But nobody told Buck that. This season, Buck carried the ball 223 times and ran for 1,419 yards, averaging 6.4 yards a carry and 11 touchdowns all while sharing carries with senior Nick Clark and junior Eli Beauregard. Buck had some of the most passionate and hard-driven runs any spectator had seen in years. With countless broken tackles, stiff arms, and jukes, Buck made himself a force to be reckoned with. Buck gives us some insight of how he worked in the offseason to be named the starter, and as well as recap some highlights of the season. For high school football, um, my junior year, Barkley Hill was the guy. and Everyone had all his eyes on him. And everyone was focused on that year and win the state championship with him. Um, and then it was the Bettendorf game in the semifinals. And uh, he gets hurt, hurt his knee. And I remember at that time, I mean, I was not expecting to play. Um, but then that was kind of more of a wake-up call because Nick Clark went in. And I'm just thinking, next year, Barkley's not going to be here. It's going to be either me or Nick Clark. And I mean, I wanted to play really, really bad. And so that summer, um, I just I was destined to do it, resilient. Um, I woke up at 5.30, um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, all summer long, and went to George with and did um, sand drills. And then at 7.45, we'd have the team lifting. And I'd do that till about 9 o'clock. Then I'd go home, and then I'd, I'd work with uh, this guy named Owens Property Services. And he'd cut down trees, and then I'd load up the the tree trunks and load them up into his truck and wheel them away back to his house. And then we have to split the wood. So I felt like this whole summer I was working out, and I had my eyes focused on just that season because I knew I'd remember it for the rest of my life. And two days rolled around, and we had our scrimmages, and uh, I was just I was really excited to have the chance to be the starter, and and that's just how it ended up. Um, favorite games this year. Um, we started out with City High, and once the schedule came out, I think it was February of last year, um, I found out that we were playing City High first game, and like I would just I would lay in bed and I think about that game for so long, um, like each night, and, um, and then once that game finally got there, so nervous. I mean, I haven't played running back really since ninth grade, freshman year, and so here was my chance. And I mean, I wouldn't say it went as, as, as well as I wanted it to, but um, we won. Um, it was a great learning experience for week two. Um, then we went, and the schedule went on. We played East. That was our big rivalry. There was a lot of trash talking for that game, a lot of hype. And uh, when we came out, and I thought we, 
we executed our first drive very well. Um, kept rolling, and it was about 4 0, and we played Waterloo West. And at this point, we, we were undefeated, um, but I don't think we had really proven ourselves yet. And so we wanted to prove ourselves against an opponent like West, where they're just our rival, and we wanted to go out there and, and punch them in the mouth a little bit, show them what we got. Uh, but that game was way too close. 16 to 17. It was kind of a wake up call without really losing, and that was that was a big deal. And maybe my favorite game all season was Prairie. Um, coming in, we were undefeated, and I, they had lost. I think it was just one game or two games, two games to City West and Xavier, two of the best teams in the state. And uh, we we got down early at halftime. It was 28 to to seven. And I remember Nick DeBurr had a a pump block, and he picked it up and took it all away. And then after that, uh, the offensive line got things going for me, and the rest is history. I, I mean, what, we, what it was heard that uh, we overcame Cedar Falls' biggest deficit at halftime at 28 to seven, and we ended up winning 41 to 30. Even after a memorable and impressive season, Buck really hadn't thought about playing college football, nor was he recruited to do so. He caught the eyes of several small colleges and began pursuing opportunities. During the season, I mean, if someone would ask me if I wanted to play college football, I would have said, no, not really. I just want this senior year to prove to myself that I can do it, um, overcome a lot of things, and, uh, you know, just have fun and, and make memories. But as soon as that Xavier game was over and I realized that I was never going to be putting on a helmet again or never tying a pair of Nike cleats, it kind of it hit pretty hard. You know, you, like something you work so hard for and then it's just gone, you know, and... There's something you really can't prepare for it because during the season I'd be like, man, I better enjoy this as much as I can because it's going to be gone soon. But I mean, that's impossible to do because you're so wrapped up into it and you just get so used to it. And then when it's gone, that's when you really realize that you missed it. Um, but then as soon as I realized after the season was over that I was never going to be wearing a helmet and cleats again, uh, I really wanted to play football again. Um, and I really wasn't getting any recruits. Uh, I talked to Coach Mitchell. He said something will come, something come around. Just be patient. And um, so I, I finished my highlight tape, and I gave it to Coach Mitch. And he said that um, how that works is they coaches will come into the to our coaches, and the coaches will hand them out saying, "Oh, here, check out this highlight tape, or check out this guy." And so Coach Mitch did that for me. And um, right now I'm looking at schools of Simpson College, St. Ambrose University, St. Cloud State uh, in Minnesota. Um, University of Central Missouri, and that's it so far. Go on a few visits um, here in the next month, and I'll see which one I like best and see where I fit, and uh, hopefully I'll find a home for the next four years. This has been Bennett Ford reporting for the Tiger Highline Online. The Muslim community is growing in the Cedar Valley and seeks further understanding. This story is by Ahmed. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Many people do not realize how large the Muslim community here in Cedar Falls, Waterloo really is. The president of the Islamic Foundation of Iowa talks a little bit about the Muslim community here in Cedar Falls, Waterloo. Our uh, Muslim community in uh, Cedar Falls, Waterloo uh, is a well diverse community. We have uh, about between five to 7,000 Muslims. There is no exact number uh, of it uh, from the statistics number, but it can reach up to that. We do have uh, many uh, uh, Islamic centers that serves this community. Uh, half of this community, uh, as it is growing, are youngsters, less than 18 year old uh, and down. Uh, we do have uh, quite a bit uh, of uh, other you know, facilities and other things for our Muslim community, such as uh, uh, the Islamic cemetery that is serving all the Muslims uh, uh, in Sir Falls Waterloo as well as around. Uh, our uh, Islamic Foundation of Iowa 
uh, here we do offer quite a bit of uh, things for our uh, uh, youngsters as well as the community members and uh, you know the community is still growing a youth leader and mentor at the Islamic Center tells a little bit about being a young Muslim here in America. We have a Sunday school program uh, for ages 6 through 17. Uh, we have about 100 students in there, um, you know, male and female, uh, many different ethnicities. And other than that, we have an older youth group for uh, kids who are generally older. Right now, um, it's not as big. We actually just started that not too long ago, uh, but about 10 members, I'd say guys around my age, maybe a little bit younger, a little bit older. Um, we meet Sunday afternoons, you know, around five o'clock. Uh, we'll just get together, you know, with the Imam, the uh, religious leader here. And, uh, you know, we'll talk for a little bit, you know, talk about things that, you know, have to do with our lives. It's not, you know, it's less of an academic, you know, meeting. It's more of just kind of get together and learn something, you know, talk about things that pertain to our life. Um, other than that, we, have made arrangements in the past. I remember when I used to go um, to West High just a couple years ago, um, we had arrangements for students who wanted to attend the Friday congregational prayer around noon. So, and obviously that's when school is. So um, we've made arrangements with West High and other schools, I'm sure as well, uh, where students can get, um, you know, they can go through the attendance office, sign out and, you know, be gone for that hour or so and come back. And, uh, and you know, administrators, teachers have usually been uh, pretty cooperative. Um, also, when I was there, you know, we as Muslims have five daily prayers. We made arrangements with the administrators to um, have a room, you know, use an office for the five minutes that we needed to, you know, during lunchtime or in, be in between classes. Yeah. I mean, outside of um, organized, you know, events and programs that we have throughout the year, when it comes time for the two, uh, the two annual holidays that we have, um, guys my age, we always get together, you know, we've gone ice skating in the past, we do picnics, you know, in George with other state parks. Uh, we'll get together, play soccer, basketball, you know, any kind of things that, you know, we are interested in. He explains how Muslims do not have anything similar to baptisms, communion, or confirmation. Not exactly. After you've accepted the faith of Islam, after you become a Muslim, whether you've converted to it or whether, whether you were born into it, uh, I wouldn't say there's any other types of advancement or, uh, I guess, ways you can go up in membership of faith other than what's in between you and God. Um, you know, everyone in Islam you know, is considered, once they're accepted a faith of Islam, they're a Muslim, you know. I wouldn't say there's any types of confirmation. Um, we, you know, we try to always advance our faith, you know, between us and God by, you know, like the programs I mentioned we've had, you know, we can, you can attend those. Kids learn in Sunday school from a young age. Um, so other than that, I wouldn't say there's any um, types of actual advancement um, as we see in other religions. This is Akhman Shahada reporting for the Tiger Highline Online. Our next story is about Connor Reem and his passion for cars and motorcycles that he's picked up from his dad, by Ken. Hi, my name is Connor. I'm a junior from Cedar Falls High School. My passion is cars and motorcycles. I've loved cars ever since I can remember. I always remember just working on cars with my dad and going to car shows with him. I've always seen him working on classic cars and his passion got me interested. The thing that got me interested in cars is we did all the maintenance ourselves and we wouldn't bring them into shops or anything, so I thought that was cool. I own two cars and a truck, a 98 Cobra and a 65 Mustang, which I'm still working on getting going right now. My 98 Cobra has a 4.6 liter dual overhead camshaft engine, has a four valves per cylinder and hollowed out camshaft, has a five speed manual transmission, limited slip differential, pretty much all the good stuff. I've gotten it to go about 150. Never really wanted to take it past that. Pretty scary. My other car is a 1965 Mustang. I just built an engine for it. And getting ready to put that in. I've been working on this car for about three years now. Got about $10,000 into it. When it's done, I'm hoping it'll be worth about $25,000. 
but I'm never gonna say. <laughs> I converted the front drum brakes over to disc brakes because got to slow it down. My motor has a lot more power than the car was originally designed to have. The 65 Mustang is pretty much my baby. I made it to be a lot faster than the Cobra. It has a lot more power and a lot less weight. It's gonna be very dangerous. No airbags, no seatbelts, nothing to keep you alive when you crash. <laughs> I've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in this car. I'm very proud of it, and I can't wait to show it off to my friends. For my future, I'm planning to be a technician. I plan to keep with my passion for motor vehicles. I really love collaborating with my dad about my car. I'm really thankful for everything he's taught me, and really grateful for all the support he's given me. Next is a profile of local artist Kristen Lutz by Nick Hall. Kirsten Lutz and I'm an artist and a maker and I have a BFA from Drake University in painting. I'm a painter mostly but um, sometimes I draw things that become stencils. To me the line between painting and drawing is a very blurry line. I got started making art when I was a young kid but I feel like most people can say that. I got more serious in high school making things in my spare time outside of school. And when it came to go to college, my mom gave me the best advice, do what you want to do and figure out the rest later. Luckily, my family is very supportive and to them, just having a degree is more important than what the degree is in. The method I use um, is something I developed through trial and error mostly in undergrad. I use acrylics and water and spray paint as well as a variety of mediums. Um, sometimes I also stencil on top of my paintings or in between the layers of paintings or I'll intentionally start a painting when I'm using wood or sometimes canvas. There are a lot of artists that I look at and there's a lot of contemporary artists so it's really hard to narrow down. Lately I've been into a lot of installation artists like Tara Donovan and Ai Weiwei. I've also been looking at um, Barry Underwood. Gabby O'Connor, David Hamlow, as well as Liz Miller. I also enjoy looking at street artists. I usually work fairly large. My like standard size painting is six feet by two feet, but the biggest I've made is eight foot by four foot. I'm an abstract artist because it comes most naturally to me, and I enjoy being able to play around with materials and mediums without rules, and like that goes back to how I just trial and error until I find something that works. So pretty much in every painting I do there's something new, like a new medium or a new way of making the mediums interact with each other. Lately I've been into lacquer and Kamar varnish and things like that to make things. Avoid the unknown. Why is the unknown bothersome? The knowledge missing is needed. What is provided is useless. Empty space is the best place to reside. To figure out where to go and what to do. To try and figure out the blankness on a page or a depth in the space. Something is supposed to be in the vastness. Assuming the known is where the trouble is. <laughs> Thanks for watching another edition of the Tiger Highline Online. See you soon.